Hello, and welcome back to another lecture in our series. This one's about SMA regression, which stands for Standardized Major Axis Regression. It has been known as Reduced Major Axis, and even another name called Model 2 Regressions. That suggests that the models we're most familiar with, ordinary least squares regressions, are Model 1. Those other names, besides SMA, I guess I would say are somewhat antiquated. A recent paper that I'll be using and citing in a moment here uh, suggests that we should be just referring to these kinds of regressions as SMA. So I'll be doing the same thing. And the reason why I think it's important that you should see some uh, use of SMA and be prepared to use it yourself uh, will also be laid out here. But let me get to that. So what I want to do is walk through some background where SMA regressions have been most prevalent, but doesn't necessarily mean that's the only place they can be used. That would be in the studies of allometry and isolation by distance, a population genetics approach. And I'll give you examples of each of those in a moment. I want to try to make clear when we should be thinking about using SMA versus the ordinary least squares regressions, the classic kind of regressions. And in fact, I'm going to suggest that SMAs are probably more appropriate uh, in many cases, more often than we think. Um, I'll walk briefly through the underlying approach. I'm not going to spend any time really talking about equations per se, and uh, the assumptions, which of course we need to think about with every statistical test. I think you'll see that they're very similar to the ordinary least squares regressions for some of the assumptions, but they differ in a few important ways for others. I have an example, too, on how we can use it in R. It's actually quite simple. There's a nice package that helps make that happen. Okay, so what is some of the background for this? Well, it's been used quite commonly in the discipline called allometry. Allometry is simply the measurement of different metrics, uh, the comparison of different measures. So it has often been used to also refer to the field of measuring traits uh, or functions, uh, growth, things like that, uh, that are a function of body size. So you might think of allometry as simply uh, limb length relative to cranial mass, uh, you know, different kinds of measures like that. And the whole point is that you're uh, relating to very different kinds of units. Um, growth, which is a rate relative to a static function like mass, body size. Uh, it's important in evolution it's important in looking for general patterns in evolution and ecology because we're comparing many organisms across lots of different body sizes and for general patterns. I'll show you some examples that might make some sense. It's also called biological scaling in that we're trying to find a scaling function, a, a model regression slope kind of thing that will help explain patterns. It is literally the measurement of these fundamentally different variables. Um, where the bivariate relationship, and this is an important detail here, we're only talking about bivariate relationships. Other regressions we can play with uh, using the ordinary least squares regression framework allow us to use multiple x's. In this case, SMA regression only allows us to work with one x. So you have y as a function of x, and x is often size in the allometry. It doesn't have to be, but that is often the case. Here's an example. You might say that brain mass of organisms, and notice this is on a log scale, so 0.01, so 10 to the um, minus 2, for example, and body mass here is also on a log scale, and you can see a pretty clear relationship on a log-log axis. The bigger dot here is us, and so we find these patterns across many organisms that can often be described quite well by some sort of a regression line. Now, in this case, they're using, typically, this SMA regression. You could use an OLS regression as well, but I hope you'll see in a moment why SMA makes sense. You've probably seen examples like this in textbooks. Here's a few more I've lifted where uh, we're relating body mass to metabolic rate, very different kinds of measurements, kilocalories per hour relative to, I mean, as I should say, as a function of body mass. Or here's another one, brain mass relative to body mass. Now, of course, this is many more organisms than the one I showed you just a moment ago. And notice that there's a line you might be able to draw down here that would be somewhat different from the solid symbols up here, different elevations or y-intercepts, you might say. 
Another one here, body mass as a predictor for heart rate across lots of different mammalian groups. So all of these are good examples of allometry. All of these cases, they would be using an SMA type of regression. One way uh, that you might think about these kinds of lines is that you can evaluate the differences in the elevations, or the y-intercepts if you wish to call it that. And also you can evaluate to see if they have very similar slopes or not. That's a nice trick with this kind of regression tool. Um, it's also been used quite a bit in population genetics, where we're talking about things like isolation by distance. A classic measure of isolation by distance is this FST kind of score. And if you haven't heard of that before, that's okay. You should probably know about it. But then uh, th relating that genetic distance to a geographic distance, notice these are not log scales. Sometimes the data can be fairly reliably predictive. In other cases, there's a little more scatter or quite a lot of scatter. And in fact, a pattern like this V-shaped pattern here might suggest a log transformation would be smart. Some of them can be really tight, but a lot of them are actually shakier than this one even. So isolation by distance has been used, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it has been using SMA regressions a lot too. And if it helps to visualize this, we're just simply sampling, for example, insects in this lake compared to that lake, compared to that lake, compared to that lake. And so we end up with these different distances between each pair. And you can uh, relate the genetic distance to those geographic distances. Okay, so there's a couple of examples. I hope you can see how it's just a standard kind of regression. We have one x predicting one y. And so it would be useful to think about maybe other cases where you could also use this. But to do that, we should think about when should you be using SMA versus OLS. Because I'm going to suggest to you that this can be used beyond studies of allometry and isolation by distance. So when do we use SMA versus OLS? Well, uh, OLS regressions, have, as you've already probably had a hint this semester and uh, should already be working with, predict a y from an x. And in fact, uh, SMA regression, you could think of as doing the same thing if you wish to. But what it's really described is estimating the line that best describes the scatter. This is an important distinction. You're drawing a line through a cloud of points, yes. But notice that OLS is really only trying to predict a y from an x, like you might have used if you developed standard curves in chemistry and then tried to predict a certain value from another certain value. Okay. Notice that that is a fairly specific goal from an ordinary least squares regression, OLS, when SMA is doing the job that we probably think more often that a regression is doing, estimating the line that best describes the scatter. Okay. I hope you'll see why there's this important distinction in just a moment. So the main interests then of an OLS regression are to test for an association where you use this non-zero slope as a null. Uh, I'm sorry, as, as you're, you're testing to see if it's non-zero. Let's put it that way. You want to see if it's different from a null. There. I think I said it better. Um, and it, you just want to know if there's that non-zero slope between x and y. So the main interest then are the p-value. Is it significantly different um, from zero for the slope? What is your predicted y values? And then what is your r squared? How well does the data fit? Okay. For an SMA regression, instead what you're doing is you're testing to see if the slope and the intercept equals certain specified values. You might say that specified value is 0, and in which case it's a null test, just like the OLS. But you could actually specify some other values if you wish to, something that you hypothesize. And the main interest, importantly, are the slope coefficient, which is an effect size, and the intercept. You can look at both of those things. You can still predict a y value, just the same as you might in OLS regressions. And in fact, you get an identical r squared. All right, and that's somewhat interesting to me to see that, that you can get an identical R squared because you actually get lines that can be rather different through a scatter of points. OK, so the fundamental difference between an OLS regression and an SMA, and why, in fact, it is about predicting a Y from an X for OLS versus estimating the line that best describes the scatter, this first bullet being the most important one, is really, I think, somewhat yeah, fairly well explained by this figure, which comes from the main paper that I know of on this method cited here by Wharton et al. Um, in a standard OLS regression, what you're trying to do is minimize the variation in the y-axis in that line. So all the residuals that we talk about in a regression in a fit are really on the y-axis, right? It's the distance in the y-axis between your point and the regression line. 
In this case, it's a short residual. In this case, it's a long residual. That's a standard OLS regression. In the SMA regression, we're actually trying to minimize that on both the y-axis and the x-axis. So now the residuals are not drawn in a vertical line axis on the y scale. They're instead drawn on both axes. And so what you end up with is the line of best fit for both the x and the y. Notice that? Whereas on the OLS regression, you're really minimizing the variation in the y. So let me go back. What that's trying to do then is give you the best prediction of the y for an OLS regression, right? The SMA regression is trying to give you the best overall fit, the true relationship between these points. And because you're drawing the residuals in a different way, you actually get a slightly different line, a different position of the line through the scatter of the points. So it really is about how to best minimize the residual variation, right? The regression is minimizing the y. The SMA is minimizing the x and the y residuals. OK, so what about the assumptions? Assumptions turn out to be actually quite similar to what we know of for a standard OLS regression. The residuals are supposed to be independent. Each measure should be independent, in other words. The residuals are normally distributed. And that's something we've heard before as well. The y and the x are supposed to be linear related, right? If we're drawing a straight line through these points, we should be assuming that there's a linear relationship there, and it's not fundamentally quadratic or something else. And the residuals have the same variance at all points along the fitted line. Well, these are essentially the same assumptions that we've had with the OLS regression. Independent measures that are where their variance is normally distributed and equal up and down the length of the line. And of course, if you're fitting a straight line to data, you're already naturally assuming that it's linear related. This is a nice table out of that same paper by Wharton et al. And they evaluate the importance of this for SMA regressions. And they say, yes, it is sensitive to the fact you should have independent measures. You have some wiggle room, actually, on normal distributions. It's useful, but it's not that critical, which is, again, roughly parallel to what we've seen with OLS regressions where the most critical assumption is homogeneous variance that we have to keep sweating. And that's consistent with the ANOVAs and o OLS. Okay, So the same basic assumptions and more or less the same answers that we've seen before on how sensitive this test might be to those assumptions. OK, so how do we actually do this? How do we walk through this in R? And then can we see an example? Well, there's a nice package uh, put together by the same people who wrote that paper, Wharton et al., called SMATTER, S-M-A-T and R. OK, SMATTER, SMATTER with you. And so it conducts these SMAs and another package, I'm, another model I'm not even going to mess with here called MAs. And even, by the way, you can do the standard OLS regressions. So if you wanted to, you could just use this SMATTER package for all regressions, all ordinary least squares and SMA regressions from now on. OK, let me walk through an example to see so you can see how this works. I have a data set here where um, it's about leaf longevity, how long a leaf stays on the tree and, and survives. Uh, through the seasons, and uh, leaf mass per area. So how thick, how heavy might a leaf be per unit area across different plant species from a bunch of different sites. So this is important for plants that might be able to survive in dry, nutrient-poor conditions. The hypothesis is that leaves with a greater mass per area can last longer. Uh, this has been uh, hypothesized for quite a while. There's a lot of different data in places like Australia uh, where things can be quite dry, of course, in the outback and uh, aged weathered soils, which are relatively nutrient poor. So here's some of the data. It's leaf life, and so I'm just attaching that as you would in R so we can view it. And so you have a bunch of different sites. I'm sorry, this is the row number here. Here's sites, and here's whether or not it was high rain or low rain, etc. Um, soil phosphorus, which is a key nutrient, the longevity of the leaves, and the leaf mass area relationship, okay? So it's meters squared per kilogram right there, okay? So we've got longevity and leaf mass that we're going to focus on here. So if I look at just a scatter plot of those data, in the untransformed version, you can see it looks more or less wedge-shaped. I just drew those red lines on. But if I take a log-log transform, so the log of longevity instead of plane log, and the log of leaf mass area instead of plane leaf mass area, you can see that it makes it much more of a linear pattern. There's still a fair amount of scatter in there, but at least I have 
gotten rid of that wedge shape. And that's one of the beauties of log log transforms. That's why we've already been doing them this semester. So just keeping those same plots there, but now doing the regressions at the same time. Here now I've got a regression that is based on the OLS model. And on the right is the SMA regression. Notice that the R squareds are identical and the P values are the same. All that's really different, and you can visualize it, is the equation, the slope. Here, the intercept is minus 0.4, and the slope is a 0.87. Okay? Notice that's times the log of the leaf mass area. This says that the intercept is a minus 6. That's a big difference. And the slope is a 1.3. So in this data set, we get a really big difference between SMA and OLS regressions. The OLS, remember, is trying to minimize the variation in only the y-axis, the residuals. And it's trying to reduce that in the, only the y-axis. The SMA is trying to reduce it in both the x and the y. And yes, these are identically the same points, but you get a steeper slope, which is pretty predictably true in SMA regression than you do in OLS. Okay, So you get a different answer simply because you're do, doing a different method. Which answer best fits the question? The question was, do leaves with greater mass per area last longer? Do they have a longer longevity? We're looking for a true relationship here across multiple species. Uh, we're not necessarily trying to predict a certain longevity from a certain x. So in this case, SMA regression should make more sense. Okay? So the bottom lines are that if you're trying to find a true relationship between x and y, we should be using SMA regression. OLS regression, remember, is intended to predict just a y from an x. Okay? Or maybe it's an y. Nah, a y sounds right. So the bottom lines then continue. We have basic regression assumptions, which are essentially the same. You do the same thing as check residuals and think about whether or not uh, data are normally distributed and homogeneous up and down the length of the fit. You use SMA in uh, macroecology, which is a whole discipline now, uh, re somewhat related to allometry, and isolation by distance. And in fact, I'm thinking it should be far more widely applied when we want to do things like describe the best fit or the true relationship between an X and a Y. Now remember, this has to be a bivariate relationship. We can't add extra X's, uh, explanatory predictors, into this. That's one limitation of this. The other thing is that you're looking for um, maybe tests of certain slopes and certain intercepts beyond just the simple null hypothesis test that is all you get in an OLS regression where all you can say is the slope zero or not. You can do much fancier kinds of tests and more specific hypothesis testing in an SMA regression. Okay, I think that's it. I think you should be able to understand the bottom line. I'm gonna bet you that SMA regression is something that's going to become more and more widely used in the future. And I think it's something that uh, you should be familiar with then. Okay? Think about if it's the right test for a regression when you need to conduct some sort of regression measurements. Okay? That should do it. And I'll talk to you next time. Bye.